You join us here today on a beautiful sunny day in the garden of design legend Terry Disdell for a special set of interviews uh, with three luminaries of the design industry. Terry, Tim Hayward and Andrew Winch who have agreed to sit down for a series of interviews about what it was like working in the legendary studio of John Bannenberg, uh, how the industry has developed and changed over the years and what they see as the future of the superior industry. Um, Terry, why don't we go to you first? Um, you were the first of this trio to join John Baderberg's studio back in the late 60s. So what was it like back then? Well, it was, uh, we worked from the basement in, in John's house. And um, I, I, there's an interesting question, how did I ever get there? Because I was a fan of his and I wrote to him and he, and he never responded. And I thought, I'm going to go and knock at the door. So I knocked at his door with this big portfolio of drawings and Jenny, his secretary, said, but you don't have an appointment. And uh, I said, but I only need a couple of minutes and, uh, and I'll show, show him my, my drawings. And uh, she said, well, you, you, you can't just come in without, without an appointment. He's, he's busy. So I said, I don't mind, I'll wait. Because I, I just walked all the way from Sloan Square with his big portfolio. So John heard the story in the other room and thought, oh, I've got to get rid of this guy. So he came out to look at my drawings and he said, when do you want to start? And so that, that was an interesting, how did I ever get the job there? So I got the job on the value of my, on the value of my drawings. He yeah. never asked me what, you know, like what college I went to, uh, was I, did I have any kind of education, which of course I didn't, because I never went to a college either. So we started, and the, the first job I, I got to do, at that time uh, they were building the, the, the ocean liner, Queen Elizabeth II, whatever she was called, and QE2 was her brand name in the office, and and John had designed huge areas inside the boat, and one of them was all beautifully drawn with rapidograph, which is ink, for those of you who don't understand what rapidograph was. And all of the walls we, John had covered in uh, rosewood, and they were all beautifully drawn with an 01 rapidograph, all the wood grain matching and everything. And it never got permission from the fire regs so we had to change it into something else and all those drawings were done on tracing paper and my first job was to scrape them all off with a razor blade which took me three weeks and and it was arduous task and I thought why on earth did I come here I thought I was going to be in some sort of creative job and I was just a I was just a, a tool of scraping drawings um, so but, but that was one of the projects I did and then from scraping off the the, the, the rose the rosewood off the wall uh, I became the model maker because where there was going to be an exhibition at the design center um, wherever it was Pall Mall or something in those days and um, all about the QE2 and one of the major parts that that John had designed was this room called the Double Room, which had a spectacular balcony all the way around. It was the main sort of dance hall entertaining space. And we, the plan was to make this model to show it, show it there. And, uh, but we never had a model maker. So I found someone that could make the staircase, but no one to do any of the other things. So uh, all of a sudden I was a model maker and I made all these little bits of furniture. And then the most arduous thing was that the, the carpet in this room was a herringbone pattern, which the real sample looked spectacular, but I had to make a model or a mock-up of it. <laughs> so I got a piece of, of suede and I got the magic markers <laughs> and I drew this herringbone on, on, the, on the suede, um, all, all beautifully masked off and everything. And that, that was my claim to fame. I took friends to the, the design center to show them <coughs> how I'd drawn this, uh, th this carpet on, uh, on with a piece yeah. of suede. How old was I yes. then? 20, 
24, 25, something, I don't know. And what year was it when you first walked into John Bannenberg's studio? 69, I think. Wow. 69. And how, big... how old was I in 69? 14. 12. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. Yeah, so, and then, and then, of course, at the same time, then he was moving on. We did a wonderful sailboat called uh, Tamahini. Oh, called Tijuana. 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 We had a, a motorboat called Tamahina. They were always confused. And that was a revolution. We built that in uh, Camper and Nicholson's. And that was a real battle because the Camper and Nicholson's shipyard, they'd done some fantastic work over the years, but it was all traditional. They didn't understand at all about how you could make a chest of drawers and cover, cover it in leather. So how do we stick the leather on? You know, it does, won't stay on. And it's so, and, and, and no one knew how to stick the leather on. There wasn't, there wasn't a kind of a, a guidebook. You, you couldn't Google leather on a draw front button and find someone that was going to give you the answer to it. So, and it, so in, in-house, we devised all these ways of how you could wrap a drawer front with leather and how it was important to tack the, tuck the leather into a little slot at the back of the door so it, when the leather wanted to shrink it wouldn't just shrink. So you were doing everything for the first time really, a lot of these yeah. techniques had never been done before. No, no, and, and, and you looked an idiot if you went to the shipyard and said I want this and they said, huh, you can't do that. So you had to find a, a solution to it. Yeah. So that particular sailboat was full of the most incredible developments and, and, and a lot of frowning from the shipyard people, which we've all had to break, break through as, as well. But John was, was the forefront of that, of the, of the forefront of what I call tut-tutting. He wants to put a glass dining table in the saloon? No, 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 no. no. This is a boat. <laughs> So what, 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 was, what was John like to work with and for? Tim, perhaps, when, when did you join the studio? I joined John in 1972. Okay, so not long after Terry? Not long after Terry. Terry sat at the desk in front of me and usually wore an Afghan coat <laughs> and, and seemed to spend his time playing with his hair, I remember. But John was, John was remarkable. He was, uh, he was always immaculately dressed. He was voted the best dressed man in London on one occasion. And he was cool and calm and, and had a wonderful way of putting you at ease. And uh, I enjoyed working for him, working with him, and then showing him how to do it properly. You know? <laughs> <laughs> but he was, uh, he's remembered as a true creative genius, a man yeah. who kind of opened the discipline of super yacht design or was the, a pioneer of the discipline of super yacht design rightly yeah. so yeah, rightly yeah. so I mean, yachts in that day and age had beautiful hulls made it designed by incredible naval architects and then when it came to the superstructure they kind of get a couple of packing cases or something and just bolted on the top not a great deal of effort went into it uh, and Tijuana as Terry talked about was one of the first yachts, don't get me, correct me if I'm wrong, but, but John did the outside yeah. and the superstructure as well. Yeah. And Camper and Nicholson's were kind of pulling their hair out. But it was that which kind of formed the foundation for the industry. And yacht designers then became a known entity. So no longer were naval architects directing the styling of the yacht. Correct. There was a whole new breed yeah. of young designers. Yeah. Yeah, the naval architects were as important as they are now in creating the balance of the yacht, the, the performance, um, and, and guaranteeing that performance. Mm. But the look, the look of the boat above the waterline became more and more the, 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 the area that a yacht designer could influence what the boat would look like. And of course, the interior design as well. The interior layout. The, the layout spaces are defined really by the naval architect and the yard in the sense that they're going to tell you how big the engine room is going to be, what the frame spacings are going to be, where the watertight bulkheads are going to be. 
and then you've got to take that and create the interior that is required within that space. Yeah. And Andrew, you're uh, the whippersnapper of the trio. The young one. <laughs> so tell us, how old were you when you joined John? I, 47. I met, I met John. <clears throat> I met John because another of his uh, personal assistants um, introduced me, and she was the neighbour of my of my parents and myself down in, in Bosham in Chichester Harbour, and uh, Christian Doyle. Christian. And Christian said, I know a guy who could help you, and if you like boats, I'll see if he'll see you. So I was given this introduction by Christian, and when I got to the door, like you, and uh, arrived, um, I was shown up and I was given a chance to meet Mr. Bannenberg. And it was like walking into uh, a toy shop of of imagination. I mean, you, I couldn't believe that there was a place like this existed because there was nowhere else mm. in the world like John Vandenberg's studio. Yeah. He had created this magic that clients were, uh, and a theater actually as well, that clients were, were won over by. And, and I remember John Nichols, after I left, this other guy who was there said, how did you get in? You know, how the hell did you get in? You're not allowed to see Mr. Bannerberg. And I just managed to get in. I mean, I was just very lucky. And uh, John was terrific and I, I, he was very helpful. And I said, I need a, a tutor because I'm at Kingston College, uh, a little bit up the river here. And um, I want to do yacht design and I'm doing interior design and 3D design. And they won't let me do my course about boats. But I need to find someone who'll say they'll be my tutor in yacht design. And he said, I'll do that. <laughs> just tell him I'm doing it. And I think I came in two or three times and he taught me how to draw with a spline, you mm. know, to draw hull lines mm. and to draw with French curves. Um, and, and, a, uh, and a pen. And a pen. And so my student, my, the latter year of my student year at Kingston, John was nominally my tutor. And, uh, and when I finished, I wrote him and said, right, the, the, the Gris show's on and you know, I'm looking for a job. And come and see my show. I've designed a boat, a 56-foot sailboat. And I've made a model and I've done all this stuff. And, uh, um, and you were in the office. You must have been there when I was doing that. Anyway, he said, um, uh, OK, eventually he came on the Saturday, the last day of the show, he turned up. And I said, can I have a job? And he said, no, <laughs> I don't need anybody. I do not need a student from art college to come and join me. Um, go and be a, go and work in the yacht industry. You ought to understand what we all do. So I became a yacht skipper and sailed across the Atlantic and skippered this boat, 50-something foot boat in the Caribbean, came back, wrote to him, had no money. Can I have a job? Please, can I have a job? And like Terry, I was given a job that, there. I, I arrived and he, he said yes. And uh, I've still got the letter and it says, make yourself useful. And that's all it said. Andrew, welcome, make yourself useful. And for about six months, I was rubbing out his drawings. <laughs> Everything he did wrong, scratch, 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 scratch. I was rubbing out Tim well, Hayward's drawings. Especially the spellings. I could never get oh, the spellings right. Oh, the spellings. Right. And we used to use the rotary pens with, with the stencils. With the stencil. With the yeah. rotary stencils oh, yeah. to do the letters. Yeah. I mean, it took forever. And then yeah. he'd hang the drawings up and then the, he'd look at them and say, John would say, no. He had a very clever trick and I've tried to use it in my studio. He looked at all the drawings from the other side of the drawing board. And you could tell very you could quickly if something was wrong. Turn it upside down. Turn it upside down. And I, I tell everybody that. Look at it from the other side. So I always walk up to the drawings and look at them from the other side, because that's actually the side that the clients are seeing the drawing often. If you don't turn it round, or you are having to look at it upside down as well. So you've got to learn, haven't you? But mm. he taught, like my friends here, he taught me how to, um, how to understand what does design mean? What does uh, entertainment mean? What does presentation mean? Communication mean? Um, he was my mentor and I did six years with him. But fun enough, the other end of your story is Tijuana was for a wonderful client called Jeffrey and Dor Simmons. And he was doing their house in, Piccadilly, in Park Lane. Park Lane. And when I joined, um, first one of the first jobs was to do their apartment for them by John uh, in Grosvenor Square. And oh. then they bought and started the uh, Ashane sailboat, which was one of the, it was the tallest sloop building in Holland at Royal House, at the time, House and Shipyard. I mean, things were different. We'd turn up at, we'd go to see Walter, Elise, and the, and the team at House and Shipyard, and there was Walter and Elise. And there was 
Mrs. Hausman in the accounts department. There are only about four or five people in the mm. office and one shed. And they were building Whirlwind um, for Noel Lister. And then they started this revolutionary boat, like you said. Uh, but Walter just said, yes, you know, if you, if you can dream it, we will build it. That was his talent. Well, the businesses, I <clears> guess, were so small back then. You know, there weren't teams and teams of people. I mean, so how many people were in the Bannenberg studio in the late 60s and early 70s? Well, when I was there, um, there were, there was a secretary, uh, an accountant, uh, and a draftsman, and, and me. That was it? Yeah. It's remarkable. Then it? the office moved to Chelsea, to, the, to Burnsell Street, uh, which is where I joined, and we had about 10 people. But two of them were, John was subletting part of the office. <laughs> and they had a, a rodent eradication business, I remember. <laughs> <laughs> and then when Andrew joined, we grew a bit more, didn't we? we well, I, I joined, and I think there were five or six. Yutaka was there, Jujima. Um, Roden Richardson. Roden. Uh, there were about yeah. six, yeah. and I joined. And I was the junior for at least three years. I still had to do the coffee, the bacon sandwiches, and the raising. And eventually I was given a job to do, and able to follow John to a client and, and do um, uh, Anthony Jacobs, the, the apartment in, up in Regents, yeah. up in yeah. North London. Fantastic place, beautiful view. Over when the when Andrew says he had to do the coffee, the coffee was a saga in itself. Oh, the coffee was an amazing machine. We had this 1930s coffee machine, you know, proper. I was a barista. I mean, yeah. I, I trained as an eraser and a barista. It was given to us by a client. And we, had, we made a plinth, or we designed a plinth and had it made. And we'd have competitions in yeah. the office as to who could do the best frothed milk, you know. Nobody and, and got, who, who could. could. And nobody got the coffee like that. I mean, that was, yeah. you know, Italian coffee, you had to go someplace to find the, the quality. Well, and the clients would yeah. come in and they'd go, oh, you know, I've come for the coffee. Yeah. You know, the machine was like... It was like an engine room. It was, it was. fantastic. Beautiful the thing. Coffee, it was the coffee, the right beans, the right grinding thickness. It was amazing. Mm. It was a Scariga. Emilio yeah, Scariga bought this machine as a gift yeah. and sent it to John in a case. He was and a Mexican client who he did wanted Aztec, to build Aztec, Aztec, 12. Yeah. He yeah. wanted to build 12 boats. Yes. And just before he signed the contract, the Mexican currency was devalued. And for the same amount, he could only have two boats so we had to and nice went on guy. to build uh, uh he went on yes Echo. <clears throat> he did he did yeah the, the the boats that we did were in van Lentz and de Vries. and then he went on to build echo in blumenvoss his draw there are lots of all of us have had drawings of boats we have not been able to do but his drawing of the uh, as, uh, of the um, azteca 2 was one of the best designs I've ever seen. It's in the book. Yeah. It's stunning. It's was a, a, it was a revolution. It, it really, it broke it. It was great. And it didn't change, the real boat didn't change very much, no, did it? No, Martin did those lovely glass windows. Yes, and, yes. But the, the original concept was very, very pretty. Yeah, the, the, very the, the double height uh, sides, sides with the, with the, the, with the, the arrow f feature yeah. was Azteca, wasn't it? Mm. Yeah. So there were different things that worked there, yeah. developed on. But it was a revolutionary. I mean, it was, uh, uh, Echo was revolutionary, wasn't mm. it? Yeah. yeah. In fact, so, we were doing revolutionary yachts, weren't we? They, you know, <laughs> and each one, each one was kind of different. <clears throat> and 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 we've all kind of carried on doing that, haven't we? Well, wasn't Still, every yacht revolutionary back then? Because there were so few of them. There were so few. When mm. I, talking about when we all began, I went. I rang up John's office and said I would like to come for an interview, and they said, "Oh." you could come tomorrow. I said, well, could, I'm in London, could I? No, no, come tomorrow, okay. So I went home and I, I had no idea about yachting, but I liked, I had a family history of, of boating in some respects. And I drew yachts all night <laughs> and went to John the next morning to present the drawings. The biggest yacht I designed was 18 feet. <laughs> I had no idea that these Beautiful, great pieces of sculpture existed. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah. They didn't, you see, the yeah. size. Did it. The size, Camper Nicholson never built anything. Well, they had done in the 30s. You know, but he, he 
created the new wave of yacht building mm. and yeah. yacht yacht desire. Yeah. I think. Yeah. I think if you try and find the you know find the core of it, he created a, an opportunity for that desire to grow again, and the ambition to have yeah. something again, and the yeah. market was going up with him because yeah. mm. he still went on and did you know with with Alan Bond the boats for the yeah. America's Cup and yeah. the, with I think, different I think people. Nabila was a big <coughs> a giant leap forward for the yachting everyone industry. says that was a real benchmark Nabila oh, it was. you still only have to go on it yeah, now it's but, stunning I mean pr prior to Nabila you've got to remember <coughs> the Corinthia yeah yeah one, which yeah. was that that really was that a was shock 72 meters yeah 72 it? meter and no one had ever seen a boat like that. Is that, that one of John's really designs did. just going past now? Probably Pink not. And white. <laughs> Looks like candy floss. <laughs> no, it's one of Probably mine. Probably not. It's one of but mine. Corinthia was one that it still is one of the best yeah. looking yachts ever. You know, the sense of proportion and everything except was it's, off the radar. Except it, it sank. Yeah. The captain had to phone up on the maiden. He was doing the delivery to, to uh, Greece. And he had to phone the client and say, I'm terribly sorry, but the boat is gone. Oh and he, he actually had hit an uncharted rock and Lloyd's paid up. And the guy, the owner, rang John and said, I want you to build it again. And John said, well, I've had a few ideas since then and we'll build something similar, but it'll be better. And then that became Corinthia. Yeah. Six? Five? Five? Six. Yeah. No, not six. The model of Corinthia was it? next door to, between you and I on the, in the studio. And I spent, so I spent six years with it sitting right there. I mean, it, you, you look at it every day and, yeah. you, and you dream of doing something like that. Mm. Something yeah. as lo with the, those beautiful lines. Um, yeah, stunning. Thin boat. Really like a frigate. Real thin, mm. thin boat. I remember and being in the wheelhouse feeling that I could touch both the exit doors, you know, they're so small. But beautiful. Your arms were that big too. No, I've had yeah. them adopted now, redacted. I've got, I've got in mind this amazingly creative, vibrant, dynamic atmosphere in the Chelsea studio. I mean, was that the reality? Yes. And you, it, was, yes. it was just a, a wonderful, creative environment. It was fabulous. Environment. Mm. We it had was. music playing all the time, and there was a bit of kind of marijuana haze about the place on occasions, but. <laughs> No, it was fabulous. Terry's death. It's nothing to do fabulous. with me. <laughs> I'd have to go, Terry. <laughs> no, it was the King's really Road. Really. Yeah. Uh, Tim, King's Road. Terry, do you mean, did, didn't, did, uh, didn't John do the shop for Mary Quant? Yeah. Yep. You know, this yeah. was the King's Road. This was, this was, was my, the photographers of the period. You know, they, this was, um, uh, name them, the ter Terry... Um, all the different photographers that were East End boys, all, all made good, came up and did, you know, made their mark in the, yeah. doing all the photography. Michael Caine era and the, the whole, the long, the, the long leather boot things going up under your trousers and the, the jacket, the cool stuff. Terry's still in that era. It was cool stuff. It was cool. I remember going, going to the launch of uh, Pegasus 3 and uh, it was going to be a big, a really big day. This was 1971, I think. It was going to be a re real big day. And I wore a green velvet suit oh my God. with flower, flared trousers <laughs> and green shoes that had Cuban heels, which you couldn't get from love or money. And they were handmade in, by some, somebody called Anello and David in Covent Garden. And uh, I was... Oh, I hope a picture. I hope a picture exists. No, I don't. I don't. I, I'm sure. I have the picture. picture. <laughs> yeah, we'll, we'll talk later. Too. But we, you know, we, I illustrate that just talking about the fashion story at, at the time because the King's Road was, was, was the place to be. Yeah. And was there anyone cooler than John Bannenberg at that time? I mean, he was a real man about town, wasn't he? I mean, he was a. He was a man about yeah. town. Yeah. yeah. Now, as as Tim said, he was incredibly well dressed, at all times. Uh, drove a lovely D Aston Martin DB5, yeah. which parked outside his house. Um, yeah, and but in fact, my first trip in a DB5 was when John took me home because I broke a leg or I broke an ankle while I was working for him one day, and uh, and he, he took me to the hospital and then he and then he and then he drove me home. So that was that was quite a milestone in, in my life as well. John was, um, I think with all of us as well, very magnanimous about, 
um, things. We, I met him at, uh, after I'd started at Monaco and I was there with about two guys from our studio. We were about 10 people at the time. And he'd just finished Th Thunder, I think it was. Um, yeah, uh, Ocean Fast, Ocean gas fast. turbine thing. God, amazing boat. And he said, he was there and he said, Andrew, come aboard, I'll show you through the boat, bring the others with you. And he gave us a design exhibition, you know, a design tour. And we were in awe, you know, double height space in that, that saloon space. Yeah. It was, mm. it was cool as hell. Mm. It was you know, a I don't cool think, boat. I don't know how, how it worked, but it was, God, it was a cool, cool boat. But he took the time. And I think that, you know, stayed with all of us. He mm. took the time. Mm. Um, when I left, uh, he was kind enough to be the first client because he gave me the three project sailboats I was building. Same for me. And I carried on project managing. So he, he initiated and funded the business to start. Mm. Um, for the first, I didn't, I didn't finish them in the first year, it took about a year and a half. So he helped me, you know, do the step, basically. And it yeah. was, it was, it was the same for me. Yeah. I, I was doing Limitless at the time. And he hired me to carry on doing Limitless. So it, it, he gave me a kind of foundation to build yeah. on. Yeah. Yeah. He was also one of the most incredible salespersons. Yeah. yeah. In his relationship with clients. He had so much confidence in how he could explain something that no one else had done before, how he could put it over and capture the client's imagination. I mean, he was the best salesperson you, you could ever imagine and, and very defensive of what it was he was trying to portray. And I always remember this one day we had a client meeting and John had had mis prepared this lovely superstructure drawing of this boat and uh, it was a 60 meter yeah about 60 62 meters I think and the, the mast was completely vertical and the client said to John I really love I love the design he said but we have to have a sloping mast you can't have this was a, a motorboat he said you can't have this vertical mast it looks wrong so John said no it looks perfect he said that mast is like it's like a feather on the chief's head. It's, uh, it should stand strong. Should The guy said, no, no, no. He said, it needs to slope back and make the boat look like it's going faster. John said, no, no, it won't. It needs to, needs to be vertical. And then the guy said, John, this is my boat. And I want the mast to be vertical. And John said to him, I know it's your boat. No. It won't always be your boat but I will always be known as the designer. And I, please, can we put in the, the vertical mast? And he said, how can anyone argue with you? <laughs> <laughs> so he was great client facing and he was great with his young he talent. He was also a great flirt. He was great with the clients. I mean, he could, could, he? He could do the whole thing, look after the, the wives and yep. the family. And, and he uh, was also just a... As Terry said, he was a great salesman. Yeah. And one of our clients said to me, John is a good salesman, he could sell refrigerators to Eskimos. Yeah. And then he could sell them a factory to make the refrigerators. <laughs> quite a uh, useful skill. Yeah. Good times. So, t Tim, you stayed there the longest? Yes, I did. And Terry, but you, you were only there a few years, is that right? Three and a bit, I think. Three, yeah. okay. God. So um, was there much crossover? There was crossover obviously between Terry and Tim. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, but we were there together for maybe 18 months, I suppose. Yeah. And Terry was very rarely in the office because he was in the shipyards, weren't you? Or, or the Chelsea Potter. Can't, or the Chelsea can't, Potter. Yeah, one of <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Chelsea Potter was unfortunately directly over the King's Road from our office. Yeah, handy. So lunchtimes was always, shall we have a look in the Chelsea Potter? Yes. Yeah, no, I stayed for John, with John up for, for about 22 years. And uh, I enjoyed every day, really. Um, and John was very kind to me in the sense that he would, if we had an inquiry from a client, he would often say, Tim, go and see if the guy's serious, you know, what do you think? And, and I would go and check out the clients and then he would say, okay, well, you know, you take that project and, and deal with it. So he, John gave me 
the authority to run my own projects within the organisation. Uh, and I liked that. And I, I enjoyed it immensely for a long time. But then John decided to become part owner of a shipyard. And I didn't agree with that. Um, and I told John and he understood. And that's when I broke away to form my own uh, studio. But obviously there was no bitterness because then he helped you start he, the studio. He helped me, yeah. He hired me to carry on doing Limitless, which I was mm. the project manager of at the time. And the shipyard hired me to do the, to do the um, interior of the crew accommodation and the pantries, galleys, wheelhouse. So that kind of, from, from sitting down thinking, oh, shit, I'm going to, I beg your pardon, sitting down thinking I better start, you know, thinking about what I'm going to do, suddenly I was inundated with work. So I was very fortunate. And Terry, was that, was that did, you, did you have a similar experience? You, were, you got a kind of blessing when you left and then... It was all. Yeah, it was. It was a blessing. It was. A, I, I can tell you word for word. When I when I told John I had to, I had to leave or I wanted to leave. And there was a, there's an irony in in this uh, in this in this phrase because he said, "But why? 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 Why do you want to leave?" I said, "Because I need more time to go fishing." And of course, I never ever got it. Um, but he said to me. You're going to be a, a, a really good success. Don't don't fret about that. You'll be a really good success. Um, just was... remember, the first ten years will be the worst. And I went, ouch. <laughs> and of course, he was absolutely correct. Yeah. Uh, anyone that wants to start their, their yacht design industry project today, it's tough. Well, I guess that's what people people look at the three of you, hugely successful in this industry, um, and others, and they yeah. think, oh, it's always been it's always yeah. been easy for those fellas. But that's no. not true at all. And in fact, I remember you told me a story fairly recently, Andrew, about you know how many edgy moments there were in the early days of your studio when you went out on your own. I, I, um, I asked. I was doing John sailboat projects, and he had about well three or four, five, I think we did with him. So there were three building, and I said, look, yes, like, I think there's a bigger market for the sailboats, John. And I don't know if you know this, but I then went and said to him, you know, could, I'd like to stay at Bannenberg's. I've been here six years, and I, but I'd really think we could do more with the sailboats. Could I, could I have a future with you sharing the, a bit of the business with the sailboats? And I'll go out and I'll win them all. And he, no, there's only one Bannenberg, and there's Bannenberg me, and that's it. I don't share anything with anybody. You know, okay. Fine, it was his business. Yeah. And two weeks later, I said, look, I think I've got to go then because I've got a, I'm married, I've got a, a, a young baby and I need a bit more money. And the only way is to try and find more business mm. than, than being an employee at that point. And uh, he, um, he understood completely. Mm. And mm. then he, he helped me straight away. So it was, it was that, it, and then I, I had um, six years or something with sitting next to, to Tim uh, so Tim was there when I got there, and Tim was there when I left. <laughs> and, uh, but we kept very good friends. My taste in music still exactly the same as it was when I sat next to Tim. And uh, you know, we've all stayed friends because we admire what we each do. So, and what we have learned. I mean, t t Tim was, um, you know, always been creative. Terry's always been innovative and a creative. And I, I like to think that the sailboats thing started, and I went off and did the first five six years was all sailboats um and that i was very lucky to had i met ron holland through john um with the Sharne, with uh, garuda and i'm even doing a, a job with ron holland now 42 meter uh, which i haven't done something with him for 10 10 15 years yeah. but i wanted to do another sailboat and out of the blue he said i'm six i'm 73 and i've got my last job will you come and do the job with me I said, I'll do it, you know, just go open the, you open the door, of course I will. And we're having such fun. Um, and he's in Seattle and who knows, what, I'm not sure where it'll get built, but there's four yards quoting for it. But we, you know, I, in a sense, I'm back to my roots because I love sailboats. Um, but I, I went through the first period, first big recession, and we've all, the first 10 years, you know, five, six years after, you hit the first recession when there isn't enough business. And I realized that motorboats were much bigger in the market. And I had to, I had to win my first motor yacht project and that was tough um, and I was very lucky to win White Rabbit with, uh, at a, as a fetcher. Right, yeah. Very lucky. But it took, 
I don't know, it took six months to persuade and, and a quarter of the fee that I thought I needed. You mm -hmm. know, you end up doing it for very little because you desperately need to make your mark. Mm. Um, on you go. So if you, could, if you could kind of, if it's possible, kind of boil down what John taught you and how you use that in your future careers, could you, is it possible to put that into a sentence, Tim? I think John taught me to not watch the clock because John would, John would come into the office before eight and he would leave after six and he worked all the time he was there. So I made it my business to be there at least an hour before him. So the coffee was ready, you know, and, and the lights were on. And then I would always leave after he'd gone. Uh, and I would use those extra, that extra time to invest in the drawings that I was doing because as Andrew and, and Terry have touched on, you know, it was all ink drawing on tracing paper and we had a big ammonia printer to churn these things out. And then you had to, when you did the drawings, you had to fold them all up to A4 size, which takes half an hour for every bloody drawing, and then post them off to the shipyard or courier them. It was different, it was a different time, wasn't it? It was slower, there wasn't email. Yeah. You know, there was telex. There was, and the fax. And a fax the fax machine. The fax machine, mm -hmm. that, was a, that was a great mm -hmm. time. Yeah. You do a yeah. drawing, and then you roll fans. it around a roller, you know, it was a calmer life. You say, ready to, to receive? And they say, yes, we're ready to receive. And you hit the transmit button, button and the roller would start. You'd like, tick, 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 tick. And you'd get these drawings out the other end, which you couldn't um, read. I mean, it was yeah. pointless. <laughs> that, that reminds me very much. You're talking about fax machines, etc. cetera. Um, when I started on my own, one of my first projects was uh, a 65-metre boat, which was being built in Japan. And... Um, there wasn't a fax machine that, that was open to the public. You know, if you, you, if you were a big conglomerate company, you had a fax machine, but no, nobody else. And I used to work all day on my drawings. I used to send them by motorbike to Mitsubishi Heavy Quarters in London. They used to fax it all to the shipyard. The shipyard used to do a day's work on it because of the 12-hour time difference. And then I used to come and work in the morning and there would be another package arriving from Mitsubishi, which was the faxed drawings that they'd been working on all through the night while I, while I was asleep. And that's how we got this incredible momentum going mm. to, uh, to, to get all the, all the drawings done for this boat. Um, uh, but the, the days of pushing a button and showing someone a drawing were very, very different to today. It's all changed in this yeah. century. I think, I think John, I'm sure it's for all three of us, but definitely for me, John instilled in me never to, never to accept that it's not possible that, and to think another way round. And I, and I talk to the guys in the office, you know, stop hitting your head against the tree. It's a forest. Walk through the forest. There's always a way through and out the other way. There's, find a route to find an answer, but don't, don't stop there and think I, it can't be done. It, something can be done. It may not be what, exactly what you're thinking. And John had this way of saying, you know, well, I mean, one of the boats he did, and I, we were on Coral Island. You know, I, how, how did he get away with saying the boat looks like this? And when you're lying in bed, you can't see out the window. Don't worry. Press a button and the bed will go up. <laughs> and then you can see out the window. <laughs> I was on Coral Island. Yep. And I didn't know that till I saw the boat 24 years you know, later. It was built at the boat show in Monaco. And I looked, I thought, how could John have done this? And one of the crew, oh, no, the bed goes up. Come one of the crew Still said, works. up goes the bed so that you could see out the window. <laughs> you that, couldn't get away with that today. No, but that Everyone boat, big windows. Coral Island was in Monaco, as we talked about. And it's a, a Coral Island, of course, now is called Coral Ocean, isn't it? And the, it was a tour de force inside and outside. How old is it? It's 25, 26 years old, I think. And the judges from Boat International's competition came on board for a cocktail party. And one of them said, when do we judge this boat? And all the judges were very excited about doing that. 
and they were told, no, this boat's not in the competition. And how old was this design this at the time? 20, no, the I design 30, was 27, 28 years old. 30. But the boat was 25 years old, I think. Yeah. It was a, it's a tour de force. And it'd be, it'd, yeah, it had been kept beautifully as well, because yes. I, yeah. I, I remember looking, I had a good look around it. And, and they, they, they took out all the old carpets and put new ones in, and they had them made exactly the same as they were drawn originally by Jonathan Quinn Barnett, who was the project manager for John on that thing. Yeah, it was a remarkable boat, mm. still is. Mm. What about you, Terry? What, what, what uh, your big takeaways from working with John, what did he teach you? Uh, the word, what did he teach you, is, is a strange thing because um, you, you, don't, you don't get taught. It's what you can learn from somebody. Uh, John never taught me anything, but it's what you can learn from, from a man like that. You can learn how he, how he went about his, his whole approach to a, to a job. He never sat down and said, this is the first thing you have to do, A, B, and C. There wasn't a chart or a, a, a broad sheet that told you how you went about it. Uh, there was no such thing. But what I learned from him really was, um, quite a lot of symmetry he was a big fan of symmetry and then he was also a good fan of of having one part of the boat internally that was completely asymmetric but the other side could actually fit into it perfectly so symmetry was an easy thing to follow if you had done one half of the boat in plan you, that was easy to flip and do the other half um, but when when it wasn't exactly an identical other half he always found a way of making the other half look like it just just fitted in um, which is just a question of how you appraise things in your head it's not it, it was it could never have been an instruction he never wrote down and said i'll do this do that like he never told me how to arrange a vase of flowers but i've, I've watched him arrange a, a vase of flowers and and i had the same vase of flowers in front of me uh, for a photo shoot and John came in and went ding, 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 and I went oh yeah <laughs> so it's it's a question of what you see in in the eye but it, it but there wasn't a manual for it yeah. there's no description of when these flower bunches arrive you are what you do with them is this so you, you could you could learn from John if you were receptive but not, not everyone that worked there could learn from him because he never taught them because he wasn't really a teacher. You, you can't right teach design designers. anyway. You can't teach it. Mm. Mm. He did the same with flowers. When, yeah, I, when we go. finished Jacob's apartment and we were up there in, in getting it ready and, and he said, Andrew, go and buy some pussy, pussy willow, the little white tails. And I went to the shop and they said, why do you want this? It's just foliage you put on the side of, but it's not a flower. I said, no, I've been told to buy it. So I, don't know, I came back with a bunch of it, three pieces. It looked like heaven. It looked unbelievable, yeah. you know. And he was a master. You've got to tell the story of, of uh, um, down in, in, in Barcelona, the boat in the Hema. He took the, we couldn't finish this boat in the, in the shipyard in the Hema. Yeah. And he took, eventually, you know, Utaka was there because he had a Spanish wife. So he was running the job because he spoke Spanish. Eventually I was there with Tim and I was being taught how to uh, tap the back of the boat with a tapping screw to, to put the name letters to on. Name but on. we ended up super gluing the name letters on because there were no fittings. And, and then he sent me off to, to look after the clients because the boat wasn't ready. And you know what happens? You turn up with the clients, finally the sun's setting at six o'clock. The boat's awash with, been washed with water, the champagne's flowing and everyone has a party. You know, he could get anything past anybody with champagne and a party. And everybody was happy. <laughs> everyone oh, it's was fantastic. Happy. What a boat. I love the boat. Amazing. Bye. We'll see you in Mallorca. Off goes the boat. Letters falling off the back. <laughs> <laughs> Super glued artwork on the walls. Uh, oh, it's fun. We went on to build stainless steel male female fittings to hang the letters 25 mil off yeah. the hull so you could wash behind and all that. You know. And the yard, one particular boat, the yard made this all perfectly. And uh, the boat left Holland and arrived in Antibes. And as it came in to be, to be moored, one of the letters fell off. So it could have fallen off in the Bay of Biscay, 
but we got a diver down quickly and got the letter back and put it on. Lucky. Things like that. We had our own, we had an extra share of luck, I'm pleased to yes. say. Yes, yeah. yeah. Mahogany times. boat, you did, John, with John in the south of France, you did um, Acajou. Acajou. I mean, Acajou, yeah. an, a stunning bit of woodwork. Yeah. A wooden yacht. Beautiful boat. In, oh, know, beautiful A varnished boat. wooden yacht. Varnished. It was varnished the largest boat. varnished mahogany hull ever built at that time, 42 metres. John said it's got there. to be, it's got to be like that. You know, got, there's no, yeah. no question. It's got to be varnished. It's yeah. the, it, why, why, why paint a hull that looks so beautiful? Yeah. yeah. Christ. Everybody, the captain must have gone, you're insane. I'm going to have to cover this with canvas. We didn't have a captain, I'm glad to say. <laughs> oh, God. Not, it was built on spec in a lovely shipyard in uh, Lanapool, a shipyard called Estorel. And uh, it, was, it was, as I said, it was built on spec and it was part of the TAG organisation. And oh, a right. very, very nice guy had just bought Tag. And he came to see the shipyard. And he said, uh, what is this? We're putting on spec, you know. And how much are you hoping to get for it? We said, oh. he said, oh. Got out his checkbook, wrote a check, and bought the boat. And it was a fabulous boat. Fabulous. It, it ran around the Med for years and years and years. Then, unfortunately, it was damaged in a bad storm while it was in port, and it has been rebuilt. Okay. 